from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We have a layer or several layers of uh, introducers and presenters here, so while people are, the last people are coming in, I wanted to certainly welcome you here today. My name is Betsy Peterson, as Guha said, and I'm the director of the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. And I'm glad to see old faces and new, new faces and new friends here for today's presentation, which is part of a larger um, public program series uh, sponsored by the American Folklife Center called Many Paths to Freedom, Looking Back, Looking Ahead at the Long Civil Rights Movement. Um, I'll be turning the podium over in a minute to Bob Patrick, director of the Veterans History Project. Bob is the mediator today for this afternoon's event and the VHP is one of the co-sponsors of the program today as is the library's chapter of Blacks in Government and I want to say thank you to both of those um, organizations for their support in putting on this program. But before I turn it over I also just wanted to say that um, Many Paths to Freedom is in this program series is part of a larger initiative for the American Folklife Center. In fact, it's part of a five-year national collecting initiative um, which was mandated by Congress and has been undertaken by the Folklife Center here at the library and the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian Institution. It, uh, over five years, we have been out and about documenting um, uh, movement vent veterans' experiences in the civil rights movement and the, and the struggle for freedom. And that will be culminating in uh, the launch of a website in May um, that will feature many of the stream, many of the interviews that we have been doing. And I want to invite you all to um, return to that and, and check it out. So come to our website and you will find all of that information. This program today is also part of a, just a series of public programs going on throughout the year, um, beginning with the um, March on Washington exhibit last year, that debuted last year and sponsored by the Prints and Photographs Division. Uh, called A Day Like No Other, and it is over in the Jefferson Building and is still up, and I invite you to go look at that as well. And finally, also in June of this year, the Interpretive Programs Office will be launching a major exhibition to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Um, it will be called The Long Road to Freedom, and again, I want to invite you to visit that. It will be up for, oh, close to a year, so please come back, come back often. But in the meantime, um, let's return to today. And with all of those provided, please let me turn uh, everything over to Bob Patrick, um, gladly, who will introduce our speakers and, and then join them on stage later for a series of discussions and questions, et cetera. And lastly, I also want to just acknowledge another guest that I know is here in the audience. Um, with the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, we have also been working with the SNCC Legacy Project. And I see that Charlene Krantz is in the audience today, and I want to welcome her. But I want to thank all of the many partners that have made this possible. So Bob? Everything's a big word, Betsy. <laughs> uh, I am very pleased to be here today. I'm Bob Patrick. Uh, I'm the director of the Veterans History Project uh, within the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. Just a quick commercial about the Veterans History Project because uh, we're so excited to be able to co-sponsor uh, this event today. But for those who don't know, uh, the Veterans History Project is a congressionally mandated effort to collect and preserve the wartime memories of America's veterans. Uh, we've been doing that since the year 2000. Uh, these are veterans uh, you will hear about today, veterans from World War I 
all the way up to uh, the brave young men and women uh, who have been uh, fighting the wars around the world here in the last, last 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we do that through oral history. Uh, we do that also through the collection of original materials, photographs, letters, diaries, manuscripts that, uh, that relate to a veteran or a veteran has written. Um, and we do that also through volunteers. Uh, we have this uh, great uh, body of uh, work that has been put together with the largest oral history project in the country today, which has been put to work primarily through volunteers. Individuals sitting down with a veteran in their life and doing an interview, uh, students both at the high school and college level doing it, uh, organizations, uh, churches, uh, the American Red Cross, again, uh, and then of course members of Congress have been greatly involved in this. And I say this because whenever I'm before an audience like this, everyone in this room, I can guarantee you, knows a veteran and knows that that veteran has a story that they carry with them. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, the, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, we do have brochures here today. Pick one of those up and you can learn how that, that person's story can become a part of the works here at the Library of Congress. Enough about the Veterans History Project. Let's talk about our speakers here today. We're extremely pleased to have Adrienne Lentz Smith who is an associate professor of history at Duke University. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at Harvard, her uh, master's and PhD at Yale in history, and postdoctorate work at the University of North Carolina. But as I told her earlier, there's a very important part of her resume that really resonates with me. Uh, she is an Army brat, and I use that word in all the good extent that it is. Uh, I'm a retired Army officer. I have two Army uh, kids at home, too, and if you don't know the culture, we're all referred to them as brats, so it's great having them someone who knows the Army here today. Uh, her book, Freedom Struggles, African Americans in World War I, looks at the 200,000 black soldiers sent to Europe as a part of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. The book looks beyond the discrimination they faced and looks deeper into how they learned more about who they were, how they relate to each other, and who they relate to in the world in general. The book reclaims World I as a critical moment in the freedom struggle. I'll let her talk a little bit more about what that all means. Uh, also with us today is David Klein. David is an assistant professor of history at Virginia Tech. He did his undergraduate at McAllister College, uh, graduate uh, work at UMass Amherst, and PhD at the University of North Carolina. If you're seeking ACC strain through this, Duke, UNC, you know, we're all on friendly ground here today. Uh, areas of special, his areas of specialization are public history methods, oral history, 20th century history, with a focus on social movements and religion. Included in the work he has done is serving as a lead interviewer on the Civil Rights History Project that Betsy mentioned earlier, sponsored by the American Folklife Center and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. David recently worked on the team of journalists and historians affiliated with American Radio Works and the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University to conduct a conscientious re-examination of the Korean War period titled Korea, the Unfinished War. Uh, in a forthcoming book, he will be looking at the military service of African American veterans in the Korean War, a less recognized and remembered aspect of what is called the Front War. Through the voices and experiences of those African Americans who were there, he will explore the desegregation of the military, the important stories of those who served, and the connection of both these experiences to the civil rights movement. Without any further ado, I'd like to call Dr. Adrian Lentz Smith to the podium to talk about her. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Bob, for that lovely intro and for helping me get on the stage. Um, all of you for being here. Um, it is true that my dad was career, mil career military. He stayed in um, after being drafted in 72. Um, as I said to Bob earlier, they stopped sending people to Vietnam when he was in advanced infantry training and then sent him to the Panama Canal Zone. Um, and he was like, this army business is fun. I think I'll stay. Um, he, people often ask me if I wrote about black soldiers because my dad was a soldier and I say no, I wrote a book about manhood because my dad is such a dude. Um, some of that'll come through maybe in the Q&A, a little bit less in the talk. Um, I'm gonna start with um, a sort of a quote, a little info. 
on someone who doesn't appear much in the book except for um, a, an, a quote that he gives that I think is incredibly evocative and says something about what the war did for and to the folks involved in it. Not just the soldiers who fought, who I talk about today, but the folks who were over there as well. There's a woman in my book named Katherine Johnson who's a YMCA volunteer for whom I really think the war was one of the more formative experiences of her life as well, uh, in much the same way that I discuss here. So when Sergeant Christopher Columbus Watts filled out his questionnaire for the Virginia War History Commission in 1920, he took a moment to explain what military service had done for him. Some of it you could glean from his basic biography. He had gained a sense of his own heroism as a member of the all-black 369th Infantry. He'd seen action on the front in Champagne, and he'd been rewarded with medals from the French and from the city of Norfolk, Virginia. More grimly, he carried physical reminders. He'd been gassed in the Argonne Forest and described himself as partly disabled as a result of his injuries. But on the final page, in a single line, he described something less tangible. Military service had carried the farmer and dock worker from Portsmouth, Virginia, on the edge of the Chesapeake Bay to Saint-Nazaire, France, on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. His unit, known and celebrated as the Harlem Hellfighters, had been comprised of black men hailing from New York to Puerto Rico, and they'd been placed within the French army, trained and incorporated with French soldiers. Watts had moved across France, mixed with French people, seen colonial troops of color. Looking out from Portsmouth, one might suspect that the world was bigger than Virginia, less bounded than the American South. But on French soil, in the French army, one knew it. Sergeant Watts, named for Christopher Columbus himself, summed it up like this. In response to the question, what were the effects upon yourself of service overseas, he wrote, I have the world's experience. World War I would bring African Americans a host of new experiences. Nearly 400,000 black folks served in the military during World War I millions more registered for the draft. 200,000 of them traveled overseas with the American Expeditionary Force. Mobilization became an occasion for all sorts of African Americans, enlisted soldiers, potential conscripts, and engaged civilians to claim a particular stance in relation to the nation, to Jim Crow, and to the larger world. For these folks, and for their families, for their neighbors, for their lovers, and for their advocates, who tied their fates to black military service, the war offered a crucial opportunity to challenge Woodrow Wilson and the particular brand of white supremacy that he was ensconcing in Washington and across the nation, um, and to make Wilson's call for a war for democracy abroad into a rallying cry for freedom rights at home. What did the war mean to African Americans? When I first started thinking about these questions, nearly 20 years ago now, I was writing a college honors thesis on African Americans, soldiers, and the First World War. Um, a lot of it came out of the papers, or a lot of, I was guided a lot by the papers of W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the NAACP co-founder, activist, um, and black intellectual, who himself had planned to write a history of African American soldiers and the Great War. He was going to call it The Wounded World, which I think is a gorgeous title. Um, and Du Bois had letters, documents, all sorts of things that he'd gathered. It was a treasure trove um, for an undergraduate in search of an honors thesis. Um, and he never finished it because he didn't have the, sort of the financial support to do so. Um, sort of following Du Bois and his papers, by spring I'd written 75 pages documenting the hardships and violence of black military service um, and the pervasiveness of white racial violence during the war, but I didn't know where the story was going to end, how to close it out. And I should say, when I, this, the thesis project began with what is now the second chapter of my book, the story of a riot involving black soldiers in Houston during World War I. Um, it's a, it's a story of the, the soldiers started, the soldiers were responding to a moment of intense police brutality in which one soldier saw, was in a, the fourth ward of Houston, black area of Houston, saw a 
um, policeman beating up a black woman on the street, intervened to stop it and was then himself brutally beaten up. When another soldier then stepped in to find out what was going on, he was also beaten up. Um, the camp back where the soldiers were located was in an uproar and this kicked off um, uh, what some have called a mutiny, others have called a riot in which the soldiers marched on the town to gain um, vengeance. It was, it's a heartbreaking story um, in any number of different ways and it's where I began with this project and it signaled in some ways that story augured the kind of interactions, the fact that black soldiers and white soldiers in some ways would battle each other um, even overseas perhaps, well, in the black soldiers' case, as often, more often than they battled any foreign. So I had that, right? And I was 19 and writing this thing, and indignant and, and upset, but not really sure what to do with any of it. So I decided to go talk to Professor Cornell West in his office hours, um, who was teaching then a seminar on W.E.B. Du Bois that I was taking. And I don't know if y'all have had the occasion to see Cornell West in person or on television, but you know, he's got this sort of big corona of hair and is in some ways as meticulous or as stylized a dresser as Du Bois himself. And I sat down across from him at, the, at his desk and I explained to him what was going on. And West said to me, well, sister, sounds to me like it was all about the black rage. And as he said it, drawing it out, rage, getting closer and closer and closer to me who was looking back at him with a great deal of befuddlement. Um, I, um, I was young, I was relatively sheltered, and I was still developing my empathetic imagination. So I just kind of nodded and wrote down in my notes, black rage, yeah, got it. Um, in the thesis, I narrated, narrated that rage as inspiration, quoting Du Bois's returning soldiers editorial that ran in the crisis in May 1919. If you've ever heard that article um, or read it, you know it's angry, but it's very purposefully so. In it, Du Bois describes the vindictive fate that had African Americans fighting for a dominant minority that wanted to debase black, soul, black folks as what he calls servants, whores, dogs, and monkeys. He supplies a searing litany of all of the ill doing. The US, the sort of white supremacist in charge of the South especially lynched, they disfranchised, they stole from African Americans, they insulted them. But in the end, Du Bois shifts to a call to arms. Under circum certain similar circumstances, we would fight again. By the God of heaven, we are cowards and jackasses if now that the war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain and brawn to fight a sterner, longer, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. We return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France and by the great Jehovah, we will save it in the United States of America or know the reason why. Du Bois's editorial had fury, but it also had great pride and it had hope. At 20, I focused on that hope. The rage that West spoke of, I didn't quite hear. I began to, though, as I researched freedom struggles, as I read Lieutenant Rayford Logan's, um, future Howard historian, his memoirs, which are here in the Library of Congress, detailing his Jim Crow shell shock, and as I read the memoirs of black stevedore Ely Green, as he talked of fighting folks um, in white, white supremacists in the army until he was either half dead or locked away. I grasped rage, rage which seared black soldiers, either tempering them or consuming them, either mobilizing them or eating them alive. But West, I think, was actually a little bit off. It wasn't all about the rage, because rage has to burn out eventually. It could become despair, it could become indifference, or it could become resolve. Black World War I vets knew this, um, and the ones that I trace in the book are largely the ones for whom it became resolved. Um, one member of the all black regular army unit, the 24th Infantry, sent an anon anonymous letter to the El Paso Herald in 1920 in which he wrote, all colored men in the 24th who've been to France and are now in the United, Sta United States wants to get it. He said they don't like the US any longer and he hinted at a plot that would surprise the world. 
Um, blood would spill, he promised, with white men, women, and children getting shot like dogs. If it took joining the Japanese, the ascendant power in the rising, the, the ascendant pows, power then in the sort of, in the rising tide of war, as one person called it, or if it took joining Pancho Villa across the border in Mexico, the writer and his compatriots would do it, anything he wrote, to pull down your damn flag. Um, guy ends up sort of showing up in the military intelligence files, um, not surprisingly. The military intelligence files are actually a, a gold mine for figuring out what people on the ground are saying to one another. Um, but there are other folks who worried about similar things. Um, a disabled white army veteran wrote in, in later, 20 years later in 1940, Mississippi Senator Theodore Bilbo worried about um, African-American militancy. He recalled seeing a poster back when he was in the army um, uh, that had two, like sort of an army of Negro men in uniform, he said, and two Negro officers. What do you see in the poster? Um, one officer asked, gazing down at what R Roberts, the observer, called the body of Negro soldiers, the second officer in the poster replied, what couldn't we do if we only knew our strength? Roberts wrote to Bilbo in 1940 because he was worried that African Americans had come to know their strength. This was 1919, he said. What do you suppose they think today? Uh, African Americans had two decades under their belt of organizing, of doing things, of preparing for the coming war. And Roberts was right. Folks had come to know their strength. Um, there are two veterans of the, of, the, of the Great War era who are both DC people, so re relevant to this city, um, and to the later movement. Charles Hamilton Houston and Rayford Logan, who show in some ways the lessons learned of World War I and what folks did with them. Houston had served as a judge advocate general during World War I um, without any law training at the time. His father was a lawyer, but that's not the sort of thing that's passed down through the genes. Um, but he had been frustrated at the precariousness um, of the law and his powerlessness in advocating for the folks that he was supposed to be working with. And he said he was going to go back to law school and never find himself in that position again. Um, and he did. Um, and when the war, when he saw the coming war on the horizon, he worked with Rayford Logan to found the Committee for the Participation of Negroes in the National defense, a group organized to make sure that African-American soldiers in World War II, their experiences did not look like those during World War I. Logan, or yeah, Logan for his part, had stayed in Europe after the war for five years, come back and gotten a PhD at Harvard, was on the staff at Howard faculty. Um, by 35, he'd come to view another war as in imminent, um, and despite the dissolution of his own experience. He believed that African Americans could leverage their support for the, for the war to advance the freedom struggle. Unlike World War I, where folks had decided to show that they were worthy citizens by doing their duty and then asking for recompense, the veterans of that war decided that in World War II they were going to strike the bargain first and then, um, and then fight. So, in the, I can't even, the CP in ND, the Committee for the Protection of Negroes in the National Defense, through that, um, he, Logan and Houston went to the House Military Affairs Committee and argued that African Americans should receive equal opportunity to participate in the national defense um, and that they needed their mor morale maintained in order to maintain the country's defenses. He argued that fifth columnists and communists posed less danger than did lynching and abuse. Um, and he said, in short, that Negroes want some of the democracy for which they fought in 1917. And the sooner, he said, the better. This was part of a multi-pronged effort during World War II um, to secure African-American freedom rights through the war. This was at the same time and in coalition with the double victory campaign. Um, that the Pittsburgh Courier, the black newspaper, launched 
um, and it used and built on the, the 25 councils that the NND had started or the councils that they'd started across 25 states. Um, with the DWV campaign, Writers for the Courier worked to remind African Americans that even a in a democracy, freedom is not a bequest, but a fruit of conquest. There would be no self-sacrificial closing ranks this time around. As one Houstonian put it, unless we ask at the proper time when someone needs our services, it will be too late when it's all over. This lobbying and propaganda fed a mass movement. As the black press drummed up support for victory against white supremacy at home and abroad, and as Houston and Logan warned that anything um, less than parity in the armed forces would ignite racial revolt, um, our activist A. Philip Randolph threatened to bring in 10,000 African Americans out onto the streets. Calling on the president and holding all those conferences aren't going to go get us anywhere, he told a union organizer during a trip down south. We're gonna to have to do something about it. Randolph proposed a March on Washington movement, a direct action certain to rouse the grassroots and give teeth to the general call for victory at home and abroad. And he asked Rayford Logan to head the DC committee. DC, Logan ended up crying off because of other commitments. The March on Washington movement went ahead as, or sort of went forward as, as for plan, in planning. Um, the march ended up not happening because Roosevelt issued the executive order allowing, giving, guaranteeing African Americans access to defense industry jobs. But the March of Washington on Washington that um, was organized in 1963 was inspired by and um, it's often organized by many folks who had experience in the MOWM. Um, why talk about all of this besides the fact that it's inherently quite interesting, so says the woman who wrote a whole book on it. Um, it's in part to celebrate the determination of pr the previous generations. Um, and it's in part to remind us that the mass movement that we celebrate as coming out of World War II um, or that some people will even truncate even shorter to the timeline to, to coming out of Brown, um, stemmed from the work built on the work of decades of activism, often with this, many of the same folks, um, inspired, inspiring, strategizing, guiding, and engaging um, with the folks who spurred the mass movement after after 54. Forewarned is certainly forearmed, it's also foundational, um, and the world's experience brought home, I would say, was powerful indeed. Thanks, y'all. Um, I want to um, uh, thank you all so much for coming out today. Um, I especially want to thank the Library of Congress uh, for having me. Um, uh, especially Betsy Peterson and Guha Shankar from the uh, Folklife Center uh, and uh, Bob Patrick from the um, Veterans History Project. Um, I've been actively in the last um, couple of months, but especially the last few weeks, digging through the treasures of the Veterans History Project here at the library. And so I'll be sharing some of um, those, uh, so, some clips with you from, from that collection uh, in this talk. Um, I'll start with a little story. Uh, at the time that Charles Bussey was born in Bakersfield, California in 1921, to be black in America often meant to be in a constant state of battle readiness. Growing up, quote, in a bigoted town taught me some hard lessons, he recalled, but it also taught him how to fight for himself. Perhaps more importantly, it also taught him the need to recover quickly before the next fight began, good training for leading troops into battle during the Korean War. Quote, growing up as I did helped me for help prepare me for being a company commander in combat. From the Revolutionary War forward, African Americans recognized military service in times of war as unique opportunities to both participate in the national project and to apply pressure for greater inclusion. These wars, moments of national crisis and international vulnerability emerge as fissures in the hard shell of the American racial order, times when African Americans could gain some experience of greater freedom while exposing their struggle on a global scale. African American participation in the armed forces, although its form differed with each war, as we heard in a historical period, 
served as a means to leverage new freedoms from a country that had long promised but failed to deliver them. At the same time, military service exposed African Americans to new ways of experiencing democracy, which in turn slowly led to increased demands for individual and collective access to that democracy. The path-breaking work of soldiers in America's wars did not lead directly to the court cases, mass civil rights protests in mid-century, nor to the civil rights legislation finally created in the 1960s, but it did involve many of the same pressure groups, and in some cases the same individuals, and it did bequeath a legacy of experience and tactics that would remain at the center of the movement as it came into full blossom. If the long civil rights movement was a war, and it certainly had all the trappings of one, enemies known and unknown, mythic generals and heroic mass of enlisted, decisive moments and grinding daily fighting, then the United Nations police action in Korea from 1950 to 1953 was certainly one of its great battles. President Truman's call for the desegregation of the armed forces two years prior to the war and the actual achievement of integration the Korean War necessitated, abetted by constant pressure from black political organizations and the black press, advanced the cause of civil rights. In my current work on African American service people during the Korean War, I argue that black participation in the armed forces and the integration of the military were together a key component of and building block for the civil rights movement. I further argue that the greater integration of the military came about as the result of a series of three combined forces. One, a sustained campaign of pressure from African American civil rights political organizations and the black press. Uh, the act, two, the actions of President Truman and the executive branch in pushing civil rights broadly and the integration of the military specifically and putting pressure on um, the recalcitrant uh, branches of the armed forces. And three, the Korean War itself, the particular needs of which forced those branches that had lagged behind to actually integrate their forces. In my brief presentation here today, I will draw on the incredibly rich holdings of the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project collection to illustrate some of the key findings of my work so far. And I do get to excuse myself, I hope, because this is very much a work in progress. I uh, hope that gets me off the hook <laughs> on some things. Uh, but uh, first, um, I want to give you a quick summation of um, the conflict itself. Uh, the nation of Korea descended into civil war on June 25th, 1950, setting off a global conflict that would put the, uh, pit the ideals of democracy and kind of communism against one another in a proxy war between the superpowers. Few would have predicted, though, that when the Cold War turned hot, it would do so not in Eastern Europe, but in a remote part of Asia roughly the size of the state of Utah. The human cost was staggering. By the time an armistice was signed on July 27, 1953, an estimated 36,000 Americans and 415,000 South Koreans had been killed, and 105,000 Americans and 429,000 South Koreans wounded and somewhere around a million and a half North Koreans and Chinese killed and untold numbers wounded. The Korean War broke out just as the issue of the un unequal opportunities and treatment, of Amer uh, treatment America afforded its black citizens was coming to a peak, playing out in greatly increased civil rights activism, racial violence, and demands from the black community and progressive politicians that the oppressive system of Jim Crow be dismantled with haste. The armed services, which had long exiled most black servicemen and women to only a few menial positions and nearly always in segregated circumstances, would be the testing ground for policy reform, especially after President Truman ordered the desegregation of the military by executive order on July 26, 1948. But change in the racial structure of the armed services was initially isolated and inconsistent. When the Korean War broke out almost two years later, in July 1950, one of the first units into combat was the Army's all-black 24th Infantry Regiment, the Buffalo Soldiers, the Deuce Four. The integration of the military would have likely come in time anyway, but as the armed forces came under greater political and ideological, pr ideological pressure, uh, the Korean War was the catalyst and was bolstered both by military leaders' bigoted dissatisfaction with the performance of its segregated troops and the urgent need for increased manpower during a time of war. After the war, Black veterans returned to the United States having experienced new freedoms, however slight, and transformed those experiences into demands for equality at home. In a number of ways, the integration of the armed forces and the participation of African American soldiers during the Korean War brought the simmering civil rights movement to its boiling point. Much of the pressure 
to uh, integrate the military came in the final years and just following World War II as a number of incidents of racial abuse of black servicemen made national headlines. The NAACP, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, CORE, the United Urban League, A. Philip Randolph's March on Washington movement, and the black press formed a loose but powerful coalition that heavily publicized these incidents nationally, generating a strong response from across the nation and especially from the White House. Truman Gibson, the civilian aide to the War Department focusing on so-called Negro affairs, recalled a meeting at the Oval Office with President Truman and several of his aides where the president vividly described the assault on Isaac Woodard, who was beaten and permanently blinded by sheriffs in South Carolina in 1946 while traveling by Greyhound um, after being discharged from the Army camp at Camp Gordon in August, Augusta, Georgia on his way home to North Carolina. After the beating, Woodard was arrested and charged, of course he was charged, uh, with disorderly conduct. This shit has to stop, Gibson remembered the president saying. I love being able to quote cursing presidents. Um, <laughs> but it did. <laughs> um, looking back on this period, a few years after the Korean War, Truman would, would recall in slightly more polite language, my very stomach turned when I learned that the Negro sol soldiers just back from overseas were being dumped out of army trucks in Mississippi and beaten. Whatever my inclinations as a native Missourian might have been, as president, I know this is bad. I shall fight to end evils like this. African Americans participated in the Korean War and supported it from home in great numbers. When the war began on June 25, 1950, nearly 100,000 black soldiers and sailors were on active duty, even though uh, the U.S. Armed Forces was still largely segregated. When soldiers like Bussey, who served with the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II, um, and as a lieutenant colonel commanded the black 77th Engineer Combat Company for 205 days of near constant battle in Korea, reported for duty, they did so to segregated units, traveled on segregated transportation, were often housed in segregated and inferior barracks. They endured harassment and mistreatment, and that was before they even got overseas, where they often saw the worst of the fighting, got the blame for the defeats and retreats, and were imprisoned in court martial far out of relation to their numbers. And all of this in service to a democracy that, that did not often include them. This fact was lost on very few black people, either in the service or those supporting them from the home front. In just the opening weeks of the war, a columnist wrote in the pages of the Chicago Defender that black soldiers were sure to, quote, whip back the communist onslaught with their blood some with their lives, only to return home to find it still open warfare on the extension of American rights to all citizens regardless of their race. These thoughts were very much on the minds of black service people during the war. Let's listen now to Master Sergeant Charles Barry, who served in the uh, United States Army for 22 years. Uh, and through three wars, including with the 24th Inter Infantry Regiment. This? I'm new. <laughs> I'm new here at the level. I think nope. someone said during this time that the Chinese said they would let us go. And that was not true. But uh, Korea was... Um, it was a lesson in mortality. It was a lesson in your religious belief. It was a lesson for you as a man. And most of all for me, it was, I am an American, and when I go home, I can't even sit in and eat where I want to. Right. I can't ride the bus. I can't get a job I'm qualified. And what the hell am I fighting for? Right. Even the integration of the armed services was not the magic pill many had hoped it would be. Some commanders willingly integrated, many held out as long as they could. Some integrated one man at a time, others flat out refused. Many of the first into battle were African American troops still in segregated units, who in many cases were undertrained or poorly equipped. Let's listen next to Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Julius Becton, her, who, first served, joined, who first joined the Army Air Corps in 1944 rejoined the military in 1948 and went on to an illustrious career that spanned commands 
in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, for which he earned two silver stars and a Distinguished Service Medal, among other awards. Lieutenant General Becton discusses here how his outfit was put together and how it was initially viewed. Uh, so in 15th of uh, July of 1950, uh, my battalion shipped out, going to Korea. Interesting part of that, when the war started and we were alerted, we were short about uh, a third of our company, and that was true throughout the entire regiment. And by the time we got on board ship, we had all the numbers we needed. And who were those replacements? They were cooks, truck drivers, people that came out of stockade, and these were the folk they gave us to go and fight. Uh, not infantry trained people. So while we're en route to Korea, we actually train as much as we could on ship. Physical fitness, yes. Rifleman marksmanship. We had orientation. They fired off the fan tail of a ship uh, with their M1s, and that's what we had. Uh, they weren't the best people to get, but they were people, their bodies. And so with that background, we arrived into Pohang, which was in the Pusan perimeter, the southern tip of Korea. Uh, the third week, latter part of the third, fourth week of July 1950. Because we were arriving with part of the division, our battalion was pulled out of the regiment and sent on a separate detail which none of us could understand why. I later found out what the story was. But, and that story was, the, the folks in MacArthur headquarters weren't too sure about the effectiveness of this black battalion. And they wanted to put us out to a place where we could be tested uh, by providing airfield security and a few other things. Uh, we went on that mission, did well. The regiment caught hell. They, took heavy fire, we were pulled back into the regiment, put into the line, and we were there when the efforts were to push out of the Pusan perimeter to take the offensive, and that was in September when we moved out, September 1950, uh, into actually engage in combat as part of the regiment. When integration did occur, it did so at the discretion of and in the manner of, the, of choosing of the unit's commander. Uh, one white commander I spoke with chose to send one black soldier to each of his 12 white companies and considered that integration. In fact, he told me that um, it was great to have these uh, 12 black soldiers because they're such um, wonderful natural storytellers and entertainers that he could send them each to um, a, a company and, and boost morale that way. So, um, uh, let's listen again, though, to uh, Charles Barry. Uh, who we'll hear talk about how his unit was integrated bunk by bunk um, and the problems associated with that, um, which I a personal favorite from the VHP collection, and how he, um, as a sergeant, responded to the complaints of his men. And then, uh, like I said, uh, we had that meeting, they said that the military was going to be integrated. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was, was about uh, half the company was shipped out uh, down about six blocks to another company. And the sergeant picked me to be a squad leader. And then he had all the whites and blacks. He said, okay, y'all go in there and pick your bunk, then, and then I'll be in there. Now, when they went in the barracks, the whites got on this side and the blacks got on this side. Mm -hmm. So this sergeant walked in, he said, I said you, we are integrated now. Mm -hmm. Now fall back out. So he said, one black, one white. One black, one white. That's where you got bunks. That's where he integrated. But then a lot of the, um, I got to say so a lot of the whites, they, they don't take bath, I tell you. I'm going to be frank with you. <laughs> but we had a problem with that. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, a lot of the food that we eat, they didn't like, yeah. you know. And then a lot of the religious beliefs were different. Right. Well, now, each person has to respect another's religion. Mm 
even though you may not like it. Right. But it's not for you to decide what religion that person's going to have. Right. But it got better. It really did. It got better, but how long, I mean, how much friction is there, and how long does it It take? was so tight, so thick, you could cut it with a knife. It was just like you was out in the desert. I mean, and some of them was, and you could hear them get together and saying, man, them niggas and this, you know. And so I had the squad, and I called them all together. Mm -hmm. I said, the first one that you use that word, going to fight me. Right. I said, I'm not going to fight you with my fist. I'm going to call you, stand your attention, I'm going to hit you with that rifle butt. Mm -hmm. I said, the man says we got to live together, then let's live together. I said, we, we, we take care of each other. We, we uh, 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 cook for each other. And I said, but a lot of you whites have been raised by black women. Mm -hmm. I said, yet yeah, you're not good enough to socialize and sleep. I said, well, you're going to learn. One of, my, one of my favorites. Yes, thank you. So the question must be asked, why enlist in the first place? Um, this is a very complicated question with a range of answers. But simply put, the armed services, although still severely limited, did offer a way up and out of difficult living situations and a chance to pressure for even greater change. In 1917, as we um, heard alluded to earlier, the NAACP encouraged blacks to enlist as a means of achieving greater equality and economic advantage. That argument continued to hold true and hold sway, especially after Truman's executive order, which seemed to, seemed to promise uh, imminent change. Once they got into Korea and into battle, many units did eventually integrate as the need for replacements outweighed other concerns. The 24th Infantry uh, Regiment Combat Team of the 25th Division was the last all-black unit in the United States Army, finally dissolved by the end of September 1951, its troops uh, dispersed into other units. Although contemporary assessments harshly critiqued the performance of the 24th Infantry and other black units, and court marshals of black soldiers were so frequent that they prompted the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall to investigate in Korea, African Americans again and again distinguished themselves on the ground. Indeed, the first major victory of the war at Yashon was won, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, probably not, um, was won by black troops, and of the more than 600,000 African Americans who served during the war, an estimated 5,000 gave their lives. Their experiences in the war convinced many veterans of the need for change, both personally in their own lives and in their home country, helping to dislodge the grip of Jim Crow. Korean War veterans, including uh, activists Ivory Perry and James Meredith, um, uh, Amiri Baraka and Bobby Seale, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Director James Foreman, and Black Power and Armed Resistance proponent Robert F. Williams, all veterans, joined different aspects of the civil rights movement in the mid-1950s and through the 1960s. For some, the personal and the political were indeed the same thing, such as Congressman Charles Rangel of New York, who served with the U.S. Army in Korea during 1950 and won a Bronze Star. Um, he began and ended the war as a high school dropout, but determined that if he survived, he would change himself and his country, eventually going on to represent his own community of Harlem in Congress. He recounts uh, this story in his interview with VHP director Bob Patrick. I think someone said during this time that the Chinese said they were going to let us go through, and this was the last. I don't remember because my mind wasn't my own, but I do know that I ended up in some damn hospital, and some officer congratulating me and for my heroism. And I don't know where I am, what I'm doing, or what the hell is he talking about? And it was hard for me to believe I was alive, that, that this rotten nightmare had ended. And quite honestly, from that day on, I became somebody. And I had a lot of time to think. How the hell did I live? And how many people that became my buddies were dead? <laughs>
And what the hell did I promise anyway? He go, and he goes on to say, and how do I keep that promise? I don't know, but I know one thing, it was easy to keep. And that's why I made up my mind that I would never, 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 five nevers, complain about anything that happened to me because my life was spared. So in conclusion, I hope that this talk has given you at least a quick insight into the importance of the Korean War in African American and American history, how desegregation of the armed service was a crucial stepping stone along the path that would lead to the dismantling of Jim Crow and the fuller inclusion of blacks in American life, and how the oral histories collected by the Veterans History Project importantly contribute to this historical project. Um, but I also uh, want to uh, conclude my conclusion <laughs> by um, recognizing the, the veterans in the um, audience today, um, most especially Lieutenant General Julius Becton, who um, it scared the pants off me to hear me to hear he was gonna be here for this talk. Uh, hope I, I hope I did all right. Uh, but I just wanted to thank um, the general and all of you for coming out today. So, thank you. Well, right now we're going to uh, have a little bit of a discussion here, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end uh, if anyone has any questions out in the audience. Um, but I, I kind of prepped these folks ahead of time when we talked. Uh, and what I'd like to do, the first question is, uh, and you kind of alluded to it, uh, Adrian, but uh, I'd like to expand on it. What, what drew you to this subject that you wrote your book? Well, when I, when I um, was a junior in college, there was no, so, I was in college, I was a history major in part because I realized that I loved stories and understanding people but didn't have the sort of imaginative follow through to be a novelist. Um, and if I had announced that I was going to be a novelist, my parents would have had a heart attack. Um, but I was taking a narrative history course and we needed to write about something. And so I went to the crisis, the NAACP's monthly magazine, figuring the crisis always has something in it and found the NAACP investigation of the Houston, what they called, I think, a Houston mutiny, um, the riot that involved these black troops from the 24th Infantry. And it was incredibly, I mean, the, my sort of first reaction to it was, they were black soldiers in World War I. Um, and then it was, and they, uh, attacked the town of Houston you know and it, it was it was dramatic and it allowed a way in to thinking about all of these many different themes and and threads that ended up cutting through first my dissertation first my thesis then the dissertation then the book um, but what I found every time that I've come back to or every sort of in every iteration that I've written about this story I found more and more layers um, to and have affected me. And in some ways, I think, as I said, the, the story of the riot augurs, it sort of foretold the kinds of difficulties that soldiers would experience with white civilian and military populations. It also demonstrated the many different understandings of what military service was to these soldiers. So you had the folks, the career soldiers who'd been in there since the Philippines, you know, since the sort of 1898 wars, who were begging the younger soldiers not to march out because their understanding of duty, of manhood, of, of worth was tied up in fulfilling their obligation in spite of whatever else might be happening around them. Coming up against these younger, more raw folks for whom their sense of manhood, of self-defense, of defense of the community dictated that they march out on what the more experienced of them knew would be a suicide mission, right? And so sort of coming to that and wrapping my head around that allowed me a way into understanding the other stories that existed within, within the World War I moment. Thanks. David? It was the only way I could think to really get the story on uh, what black folks thought about white folks' bath bathing habits. So, uh, <laughs> no, um, no, I um, had the good fortune of being involved in a uh, radio documentary um, uh, at right around the an 50th anniversary of the end of the Korean War, um, and uh, got to interview a lot of um, uh, African American veterans for that. And as a student of the Civil Rights Movement, it just it, you know, I just got this uh, this hook into me 
it didn't make sense to me that what seemed to be a very crucial turning was kind of left out of a lot of um, the way that the civil rights movement is um, often taught. And um, veterans just kept popping up over and over. Um, and so I went on to uh, work on other subjects. I wrote about religious folk seminarians um, in the civil rights movement and left this project. Um, sat on the shelf, unfortunately, for 10 years. Um, and now it's back off, and I'm in the middle of it again, um, and just uh, convinced um, all over again that this is such a crucial uh, piece. So. I would also say it's, it's very timely for both wars. Uh, we, we've just uh, probably still commemorating the, the 60th anniversary of the war in Korea, uh, the Forgotten War, and as information as we can still get out about that war is, is important. And I'm sure you're aware that in, in the next few years we'll be commemorating the 100th anniversary of World War One, and we're going to have a, a, an ongoing program here at the, at the library. On that. So I think both of you were, were very timely in what you did. Um, what both of you also did, uh, and I appreciate the kind words of the Veterans History Project, David, is, is to talk about the individual story. I talk about individuals talking about their experience and what they went through. Um, can you elaborate on that as far as why you think that was important to do? And uh, I'll put you on the spot. Do you have any kind of one person, two persons, three persons that kind of impacted you most as you started uh, hearing these stories. David, you want to start with that? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that it's um, it's just so, it's hard to even answer that question in some ways as a historian, and I run into this all the time with um, fellow historians who are much uh, more sort of paper uh, document source based. I, I can't imagine doing history without working with people and, and their stories. To me, that, that's what makes history. Um, and that's why I chose to work on topics where people are still alive. Uh, so um, it, it just, it just uh, bring, you know, brings this whole thing um, to life so clearly. Um, and there's so many characters um, that, that you meet and stories um, that resonate with you. And really, I think that's why I did, and uh, I was a journalist first and then followed, um, then sort of changed careers and became a historian. I just love listening to stories. I've always sat at um, the foot of my elders and listened to their stories. Um, I have to say, I mean, you already saw one of my favorites. This is my newest discovery is, um, and he's not the, the, he's not the other Chuck Berry, but this Chuck Berry. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just love his, his um, honesty, it's, it, it's just amazing. Um, I would say the other, there are two others. Uh, there's um, a gentleman, uh, Mark Halpern in um, Houston, who had it incredibly rough. Uh, everywhere he went, this is, I was trying to talk a little bit about integration was sort of, you know, uh, happened in very different ways in different places. Wherever he went, he was the only black soldier. Uh, and he got it bad. Um, and I was um, so impressed with his ability to survive these things um, and his honesty in sharing them with me. And then the other was a guy in Boston, Larry Hogan, who was in, was in one of the units that got there first and didn't get relieved and just got chewed up. Um, and he talked about, one, I believe, one other um, soldier who started with him made it to the end. Um, and he, he, said, he told me the story about after every firefight, they would sort of pick themselves up out of the dirt and look for each other and see each other and go on to the next day. So those are some of the ones that have really stuck with me. Um, well, in answer to the one part of your question, I think I wrote my book through characters because that's how I think. You know, there's some people who approach the sort of historical writing through the idea, the grounding of modern feminism or something like that. Whereas I both process and convey information through narrative. So in order to wrap my brain around a story, I had to have a story. Um, and then when you have a story, it sort of is more elegant to have characters that carry you through. Um, but my favorite people, the people who sort of emerged most in the book are the ones who, I, I used a lot of memoirs and who, memoirs or reason, reasons for writing them intrigued me. So I think it was sitting in the reading room here where I was reading Rayford Logan wrote his memoirs about, he wrote his, he wrote his recollections of his World War I service, I think on the eve of World War II, or during World War II probably. But he's recalling his colonel, the guy who was in charge of his um, initial unit when he was a lieutenant, Glindy Young. And he wrote in his things to, you know, 
to cuss while quoting people, um, Glenda Young was a son of a bitch. And then he puts in parentheses, you who are reading this, when you talk about him, you say that I said he was a son of a bitch. You know, again, okay, duly noted. You know, if you look in my book, Logan called his colonel a son. But it was the sense like, I mean, one of the things that I love about Rayford Logan is that he was fully aware, like, unlike some folks who came into their own, who, who realized an unexpected future in World War I, like, Logan knew he was off to great places. He was certain of it for himself. The war directed which way those places went or what those places were. Um, but that kind of, like, I can't imagine writing a, a memoir with, the exp with enough moxie to provide instructions for the future reader, right? <laughs> um, but then there are the people, you know, one guy named Ely Green, a stevedore from Waxahachie, Texas, who I follow all the way from Waxahachie to France and back again, who I adore because his memoir is such an assertion that he mattered. You know, he was someone who didn't learn to write until he was 20 years old because he was dating some woman who basically was like, I ain't gonna be dating somebody who can't read. Um, you know, and so he has the memoir of someone who came up in, or, or the memory of someone who came up in oral tradition, mm. but he's able to write it down. And he's just, he's again, no, you know, like he knows he's a good looking man with charm and that comes up again. So when I read his mom memoirs, again, to sort of bring it back to how my father sort of conditioned what I was tempered to see. I kept thinking of how my dad would walk into rooms when I was young and for no reason at all just go, baby, your daddy is a man among men and a god among women, and then just walk out, <laughs> right? Um, but it's that, again, that sort of, in some ways, what is a sort of self-preservational ego that allowed people to take the trauma both of war and of disillusion and betrayal by the folks who should have been their sort of brothers in arms and turn it into something more than self-destructive bitterness. Like those were the folks that I found most interesting. Kind of picking up on a theme you just picked up on, um, you talk a lot about manhood. In fact, both of you do. Could you kind of relate why that came out in, in your book so much? Uh, David was that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it came out in part because it was just, it was all over the place. And part of that is because, you know, the, the 19 teens and 20s when I that I was writing about were a period in which, you know, women got the vote at the end of World War I. Right? Um, but where manhood was the language through which citizenship, particularly in what had been this kind of idea of based in kind of old style republicanism of like a man is the master of his household, blah, blah, blah. Right? That was the language of citizenship. And that was the language that people used. And so the question became, what was that language imbued with? So I have all of these African-American women, women who are involved in the club movement, women who serve as um, volunteers with the YMCA overseas, who are also using the language of manhood, not because they're trying to exclude themselves, but because they see within that a way to voice the expectations for the entire community. Um, and they see putting forth manhood, defending black manhood as a way to gain full community rights. Um, and then, so the question becomes in some ways, how do, how do those definitions change over time and what does the war do to tweak what people imagine, and, and migration and all of these other things that are tied to the war, tweak what people imagine a man to be? And I, I didn't want to go first on that question because I feel like I'm just starting to grapple with this uh, for the Korean War period. But um, I also am just finding it everywhere. It's so and it's it, it's um, right there. And 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 I think in ter I you know I tried to illustrate that a little bit in the talk with um, the opening slides of the sort of men with guns um, and the quote from Robert F. Williams. But um, you know. Part, part of my project in trying to look at a broader view of the civil rights movement involves, you know, we, we, we like to focus and celebrate the, the nonviolent um, part of the movement and not include always those who chose um, armed self-defense. Um, a number of these men who served in Korea and were, uh, you know, weapon trained, um, that becomes very much a part of their notion of who they are as, as a man um, and what it means to defend oneself. 
um, and a number of the deacons for defense, for example, in Bogalusa, Louisiana, um, came from that uh, veteran background. So it's something I'm really um, going to explore more. Yeah. And if you look at the, you remember the, like the placards, you see like eyes on the prize or in the marches, there are people holding up in the movement. The language doesn't go away, right? They're holding up signs that say, I am a man. And that is both an assertion of humanity, but it's all, it, it is also an assertion of, of manhood. Mm -hmm. And the other way, I was thinking about this as you were talking, so I'm writing right now about a, um, folks who get beat up in the jail in Winona, not the SNCC workers, but a few years later when another one does. And looking at the court cases, the number of white police officers who identify themselves as Korean War mm -hmm. vets mm -hmm. is also striking. So there's a way in which you can see sort of the violence on the ground, at least in Mississippi, as a spillover mm -hmm. from the tensions that were already in place from, from Korea. I think both of you talked about this uh, in what you said, but what was the, the real impact on the civil rights movement coming out of World War I in your eyes, and, and likewise uh, with the Korean War? Um, David, you want to go first? <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's my turn. So um, I would say, you know, there's, there's the role of individuals that I talked about just a little bit about certain um, uh, people who become uh, activists, but th think about the definition of activist, I think, very broadly, because I'm not just thinking about the people that I named, but uh, any number of returning soldiers who um, worked for change even, you know, within their church community, within their neighborhood, um, I think were inspired and were part of the movement as I see it. Um, and, and I think also you just, you can't discount the fact that this enormous institution, the, the military and the armed forces, uh, took, did eventually um, integrate and um, ahead of many other parts of American life and did s um, set a precedent there. So I think that's vastly important. I think after World War I, you have a few things. The number of NAACP branches um, explodes during the war years, it shrinks um, not long after, in part because of the wave, you know, the red summer of 1919, this tide of intense white supremacist violence, like riot is not the word for what happened in 1919, right? These were like pogroms that were going on across the country. And so those crushed the flowering of, a lot of the flowering of African American, African, uh, African -American activism in the wake of the war. But even so, you get NAACP branches that even if they grow and then shrink, the sort of structures are in place for people to pick back up a few years later. You've got massive number of groups going into the United Negro Improvement, or Universal, the UNIA, I can't remember what they use, Negro Improvement or Organization Association, the Garveyites, um, many of whom, um, which provides both a sort of domestic organizational form, but again, increasing, enhancing, intensifying, the sense that African Americans are part of a great community of black people for whom these causes are connected, right? So part of what shifts is these kind of institutional memberships, but also an imagination, not just of what's possible, but what is community. Um, and you've got the folks, the strategists, like, so I didn't mention about Houston, you probably know that he is the architect of the NAACP's legal strategy to bring down Jim Crow. He's basically the mentor to Third Marshall and a host of other people. You have the folks who are sort of, the, for whom World War I is the crucible, who carry that fight forward and who are instrumental to designing the post-World War II movement. Thank you, thank you both. Do we have any questions in the audience? Anyone have a question you'd like to ask? Right here. Uh, to thank you for telling me something more about um, Professor Rayford. I only know his work about the issues and his pioneering work, and now I know a little bit more about him. Um, but Professor Klein, um, it seemed to me that the what, what I've read about the Korean War, including I think by black scholars, uh, indicated that there maybe were actual problems with performance of black troops, especially the segregated troops, partly because of morale issues, because they were still segregated. Um, and I wonder if you want to comment on that. And also, I think African Americans were way over re represented in the rather tiny number overall still, but uh, who defected to 
North Korea at the end, uh, POWs who decided to stay with uh, Korea, North Korea rather than on the other side. I mean, I wonder if those two comments are accurate. So I'll start with the uh, second one first. Um, uh, not in terms of actual percentage, so there are two African Americans among the group of 11 or 17 or whatever, I can't remember what the actual number, but it was, it was there were only two. Um, though I think it caught the public's and the, and the media's imagination, and also um, in part because the North Koreans and the Chinese especially um, used a kind of a, a campaign all throughout the war, an appeal to African-American soldiers saying, what are you doing fighting this war when you don't have democracy at home? And so I think people caught on that and said, oh, look at these, at these um, African-American men who left. But it, they were, it was only two. Um, one of them um, did a sort of a subsequent um, biography with his daughter, which is quite good. Um, the first part of the question was? Perform so uh, there's, yeah, there, there was a mixed record. It's, it's a complicated story, of course. Um, uh, there was a mixed record there. A, a number of the troops who went in first, of course, were coming, you know, they were on um, uh, leave or they were on occupation duty in Japan. Um, they were not training up to um, battle standards, clearly. They, were, they had um, old equipment. Um, there were, many of them were in summer uniforms when they were rushed into harsh winter conditions in Korea. Um, so uh, there was, um, I think, you know, it's fair to say that there, there was some difficulty in performance. There are also a, a lot of circumstances that explain that. Um, and I don't think there's any doubt um, that the contemporary, at least mainstream media evaluation of their performance was way over the top and, and quite um, racially toned. Um, and the army, um, after many years, you know, the, the, the sort of the first official account of the 24th, um, the, the army's own account of the 24th performance um, was critiqued for years um, by scholars and veterans alike and then was redone and that still has some critique but it gives a much I think uh, more nuanced explanation of the of the performance. Any other questions? Uh, just this week there were uh, many soldiers who posthumously or you know very belatedly were honored at the White House as a result of their service. And so I picked up quickly when I heard the mention about a disproportionate number of African Americans where court martial discipline didn't get promotions and all. And I wonder if there's anyone looking at that history to see how those stories need to be retold. Because families were damaged, people were damaged as a result of those stories being the public information about their family members. My, my understanding is there is a lot of work uh, underway to, to correct that. Um, I don't know, General Becton, if I can call on you to if, if this is true and if you know about work that's being done. any in-depth assessment as to the discipline that was handed out, but as far as the awards, by the way, which is taking place today uh, in the White House, that's not the first time that's done. They did that about 10 years ago, and we had some nine black Americans who were honored or their ancestors were honored with the medal, with the congressional medal, with the medal of honor. But it's a kind of a thing that people like these folks up here will inspire other folks to, to look more to. And with Bob Patrick and the use of the Veterans History Project, that's an opportunity to get on record what has been hidden inside so many people. And so I applaud all of those from that standpoint. But I must point out one couple of things. The 369th 
that was mentioned from World War I, I was in the 369th in World War II. It was a black unit then. And what may not be realized that they were fo fighting for the French in the French army and not for the U.S. Army because the U.S. commanders would not have black soldiers fighting for them because they felt they could not, would not fight properly. One additional point, in 1925, the Army War College had a study about why black soldiers fail because they lacked leadership, they lacked initiative, they went over a whole litany of things that they could not do. And it took a very simple thing, like Eleanor Roosevelt, when she went down to Tuskegee and insisted upon riding in the back of an aircraft flown by a black American, a fellow named Anderson, over the objection of her security and everyone else, she went to prove a fact that black men can do things like that, can be effective can be leaders. And that started the 92nd, let me back up, that started the uh, Tuskegee Airmen on their way, which led to their combat so well documented. And it's more people raising the kinds of questions you're raising will get more of these things out. And oh, by the way, there's another book in the library that uh, mentions some of these things too. It's uh, Something back then. Uh, <laughs> autobiography of a soldier and a public servant. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sure. Um, I was going to say that what that Army War College report did not say is that the Army leadership during World War I was so opposed to the few number of black black officers that had been created through a segregated army camp, or sort of mid-level leadership at least, that they, those soldiers were being sabotaged from the moment they sort of took command. Um, so Logan was one of many, Logan came out of, I can't remember if he came out of the segregated office camp or through sort of ROTC stuff, he came in as a first lieutenant, but he was quickly moved out of leading fighting forces to overseeing um, um, labor forces, um, stevedores and such, it, not because he was incompetent, but because people around him didn't want him in that leadership position, right? Folks seized any opportunity to demote black officers. And then I'd say also that the over prosecutions, the misrepresentations, um, of folks in the military as criminals is happening within a context, right, where black criminality is being exaggerated and blackness is being defined as criminal from the progressive era onward. So it's not happening in isolation um, in, in the military, nor does it end um, after the successes of the civil rights movement. So it's a part of a deeper, longer, in some ways, more insidious story than the one that we're telling right now. Got time for one more question, anyone? Yes, sir. One of the things that always impressed me about um, Harry Truman was his willingness to step out and uh, pass the directive to integrate the armed services. What struck me today was <laughs> Did that trajectory play a role in the Korean War, or was it beginning to take effect? What would have been the effect had this directive not been in place in 1948? Because I'm picking up that there was still, and from what um, General Beckton and others have said, a lot of integration still had not occurred by the Korean War. So, was there some turning point with the Korean War and that directive? So how does that trajectory uh, show itself leading into the, I suppose, the focus of the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s? Just if, that, if you picked up enough mm -hmm. from your 
research? Yeah, I, it, it really took the war to, to, to integrate. Um, and um, again, it was one of the wording of the executive order, um, as in other integration orders that we're familiar with, was vague. It was a, it was a kind of an all deliberate speed um, kind of parallel. Uh, I'll do haste, uh, something along those lines. And, um, but so there was not, there was not a, a timeline laid out, right? Um, and each of the branches took this charge in different ways and each, um, uh, and, and down to the level of, you know, the, the commander of the training camp, for, for example. Um, I believe your General Becton's commander said, um, you know, we, we've got this executive order, but that's not going to happen here, right? Is that correct? Uh, Actually, it was not my commander, but the, at Aberdeen Proving Ground, I was there for a short reserve training period, and I think I can be here to work here. Yeah. <laughs> and the commander read, read the order to all the officers that he required to be there. And after he finished the order, he said, so that was the kind of thing that was happening, um, and the different branches pr proceeded at different speeds, and the army was definitely the um, was holding back the, the most. Um, what um, you're shaking your head? You want to say the Marine Corps? <laughs> okay, so the army and the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I would agree with that. <laughs> um, but. Um, what it took was the, the the necessity for bodies, right? For warm bodies in terms of replacements. This is the, the what's told us the common story that when you needed um, a replacement desperately, you weren't so concerned um, about uh, sticking with those racial lines anymore, and that's really what um, did it. Um, and the and the disbandment of the twenty fourth, uh, which, as I said, was um, there was a lot of controversy around that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. Uh, I ask you to check the calendar of other programs that will be uh, held later this year uh, as a part of the commemoration of the Civil Rights Act. And please uh, join me in also thanking Dr. Adrian Lynn Smith and Dr. David Klein for being here today. And please also uh, thank uh, Bob Patrick, Director of the Veterans History Project. And Lieutenant General Julius Becton, thank you. Uh, I was going to say, David, I thought your new, new, new favorite would be uh, Lieutenant General Becton in terms of engineering. Yes, yeah, this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.